Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers followed by our information break, and then our main speaker, who will speak for 30 minutes. Our first 10-minute speaker is Baba Tunde. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Baba Tunde. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. Thank you, Jero, for asking me to speak. And um, thanks to Rajesh and Ashley for praying, for praying with me before the meeting started. Wow. My home group is the Atlantic Group. And uh, Jay is my sponsor. I'm rewalking the step. I'm on step three, but I am practicing 9, 10, 11 from the previous work that I've done. Um, wow, it's amazing. This is really happening. (sighs) See, um, this table is turning. I was telling Gerald last night, like, I'm the guy that was always sitting in the back and just, you know, taking inventory of people, you know, speaking, but now I'm here, you know, but... (sighs) Um, How did I get here? See, so... (sighs) I, you know, so sometimes I kind of wish, like my alcoholic head, my alcoholic head is like, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm, this is not really happening. I'm just here because I want a better life. You know, I came here and you guys look like you have an amazing life and I want part of that, you know, and um, I, you know, I started, you know, it was just, but I came to find out I am an alcoholic because before I came to Atlantic Group, I, um, uh, okay, let's retrace. I'm losing myself. I'm so nervous. I'm so sorry. But, um, I came into Alcoholic Anonymous on August 4th of 2005. And the first message I received that day was a woman spoke how hopeless she was and how hopeful she had became, you know, since she started coming to AA. And and I was just like, this is it, you know. And she was a blonde woman. I didn't think I had anything in common with her, but just hearing her speak, you know, I got a meeting book. A friend of mine brought me to that meeting, and that was after four days of, you know, drinking and drugging. Drug is a huge part of my story, you know, and um, I'm going to leave that to the side because I am an alcoholic. Before I got here, if you told me that I was schizophrenic and I was bipolar, I would believe you because I just know something was wrong with me. And um, I didn't know it was like, untreated alcoholism. And um, But I'm here now, and gosh, Relax. What I have found is a program of recovery that works for me. And I don't want to give that up for anything in the world, you know. <sighs> kind of, I, there's so much I want to say, but just, I just blank out and I don't know where to begin, you know, but, uh, I was born in Nigeria, and my family moved here in 92. Before I moved to the U.S., I dropped out of high school, and I came back to America. They, you know, they brought me here so I can go to school, and I didn't have friends. When I got here, I thought it would be a good idea to 
Uh, John, the guys that smoked the greeneries and I grew dreadlock, you know, I wanted to be a Rastafarian and, you know, it was a thing. And that's what I did for like six years. And the first nine months of growing dreads, my family was just like, is going somewhere else. You know, I didn't speak with my family for nine months. And finally they turned around and, um, then, you know, I graduated from greeneries into other things. I went to school for fashion design. I went to school for five years. I didn't get a degree because the third year into my college year, I had, you know, got involved with uh, heavy stuff. And uh, I was always very good creatively, but, uh, you know, with the... Uh, you know, but, you know, I was a self will run riot, basically. That's what I was. And this is my story, I basically. Like, when I was drinking... I was totally dreaming, maybe nightmare is what I want to call it. I was always driving. I'm 36 years old, and I don't know how to drive a car. I don't have a driving license. But in my dreams, in my crazy nightmares, I was always dreaming about driving a car, or, and I would be crashing and crashing. And I wake up like, why am I dreaming these crazy dreams, you know? But it came clear to me now, you know, that that was me running the show, you know, and that is my self-will, and I don't want to take it back. I have surrendered to a program of recovery, which is Alcoholic Anonymous. Uh, Alcoholic Anonymous saved my life, you know. I wanted to die before I got here, and when I met my very first sponsor, I had 22 days, and I went up to his studio for a photo shoot, and I was to be photographed by, you know, in a project I was doing. And, you know, someone told me from a meeting, oh, there's this photographer, he's in recovery. And I went up there, and the guy has a big smile, and he's living it, you know, he's taking pictures, he's doing his work. And I was just like, wow, you have seven years of recovery? That's amazing. But prior to that, you know, I was going to a meeting with um, 45 Solution, and... um because I was going to that 45 solution meeting, I would go to like five, me- you know, five minutes a day sometime. But you came to me like, I need to write down 45 things that is going to make me better. And I was talking to one alcoholic, and that guy said to me, the first thing you want on that list is a sponsor. And why don't you go home and pray about that? And um, that's what I did. And about five days later, I met. Piot, and he was a photographer. And I, it was funny because I was like praying, like I want an artist, I want someone that's living a dream. And when I met him, I was like, wow, this is my prayers. Like I'm going to be just as sober and in recovery and well as he is. And uh, it was like, do you pray? I was like, yes, I prayed. It was like, do you believe in God? And it was like, yeah, I believe in God, you know, because my whole bringing, my family divorced when, my parents divorced when I was three. So from age of three to about 11, I lived with different relatives and um, I had to practice every religion that they practice. So it was totally like when I came to America, I was just like done with religion and everything else. And so when he was talking to me about God and stuff, I was like, I have an understanding of God, you know. And um, without this program, really, I'll be doomed to an alcoholic death. That I know for a fact, you know. When I started reading the book with him, you know, I I was so short in, with my alcoholism that I could not read and understand what I was reading. You know, I couldn't comprehend anything. But thank God that he read to me, you know. And um, that's how I started, you know. That's how I started. I wrote out my first, you know, my first step and things that I buried that I didn't want to talk about. I shared it with him. And, um, you know, my recovery began. And it's a one-day-at-a-time program. But for me, I have engraved it in my head that to drink is to die, you know. That is like I pray every morning. I I use the third step prayer on page 63, and um, I could hold the job today, you know. I'm grateful someone in the program here hooked me up with a job when I had six months, and I'm still there. I'm just grateful for, the, you know, for this program, you know. I have a sponsor, they have a sponsor. You know, if you're new, you know, you're in the right place. You have all these people, all these power of examples to take you through the book. And one minute. <sighs> I 
don't know, but um, I can't believe this is really happening, you know. I'm here, I'm sober in New York City, you know. The, I never thought I would be in New York City and be sober, you know. I moved to New York City on February 14th of 2005 with the mind that I am not going to do drug and I'm just going to like be a social drinker but that went off the window three weeks later you know and uh, and six months later you know I end up here you know I <laughs> you know the best thing that happened to me in New York City is that I found a power greater than myself and I'm very 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 grateful to be a member of the Atlantic Group Thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our second 10 minute speaker is Beth. Wow, okay. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have notes. I don't know why, but um, I guess it's my story, and I, I really can't mess this up. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I'm definitely an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is March 24th of 2005. My home group is First Things First on 96th Street. My sponsor is Stacy. I'm new to the Atlantic group. I probably have about four months here, so privileged to be speaking here. I have three sponsees um, living in 10, 11, and 12. And I'm really nervous. <laughs> it's kind of intimidating. Um, I, um, I want to welcome the newcomer. Um, it helps me so much to know I still consider myself a newcomer, even though I'm coming up on four years. The most important things I learned in my first 90 days, and I'm actually going to focus what I talk about tonight on things that I learned uh, when I was new to recovery, because it keeps me very green, and I, I am still very green, even though I, I do almost have four years. Um, I know that there, someone, someone to make me laugh before the meeting told me there are three types of stories I can tell. Uh, the one I plan to tell, the one I'm going to tell, and the one I wished I would have told. Um, so knowing that I can only go those three ways, I'm a little bit less nervous. Um, what qualifies me as an alcoholic and why I'm here is, um, it stopped working for me. If it still worked for me, I'd be out there drinking. Um, because I loved it. I loved alcohol. I loved it. Um, I love the ambiance. I love the smoky bars. I love the way uh, lipstick looked on my lips when I go into the women's bathroom and put it on after I'd have a glass of wine. Um, I love the way light danced off a glass of Chardonnay. The darker the bar, the better. Um, I loved putting in a good hard day's work because I could have Chardonnay right after work. Um, I loved watching crime shows while drinking bottle after bottle of wine. <laughs> I loved thinking one day how I was going to write those crime shows. And... Um, how I was going to commit the crimes. I mean, I lived a magical, magical life, uh, and I never left the couch. When my husband at the time started yelling at me and bitching at me for um, drinking so much wine, I decided to drink the wine outside of the apartment, and that's when my bottom started, my six-month slide, and I started waking up with um, bruises, and I didn't know where they were coming from. And I started coming home at 5 in the morning. And um, I took on a second life. And it was only when um, I started to think about taking on a third life that I thought maybe I should come into the rooms of AA. Um, but that's a story for another meeting. 
a different type of meeting. <laughs> I drank at people. I didn't talk to them about my feelings. I've learned in the rooms of AA that, um, indeed, feelings will not kill me, but drinking will. And sometimes they feel like they're going to kill me. Um, I'm so blessed to have three sponsees. I will, will share that one of my sponsees came over to my apartment yesterday um, because she was going to drink. And all we did, she just laid in my bed, and we did crossword puzzles. We didn't talk about sobriety. We didn't talk about step work. She just needed company. And sometimes that's all we need is just to be next to somebody. Um, because you never have to be alone in this program. And I love the we part of this program. I thought I had to do everything alone in recovery, and it's scary. I thought it was, okay, I'm going to get sober. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to get sober. I'm going to learn how to do this, and then I'm going to leave, and I'm going to figure out my life. And I made a deal with God when I came into the rooms of AA. I said, okay, God, I'm, I'm willing to get sober. I'm willing to put down the drink, but I want you to keep my marriage together, which was at best verbally abusive and controlling, and um, I want to keep my rock star career. In my head, it was rock star. Um, I have the power, the you know, power to throw magic dust on things that are less than stellar and make them spectacular. Everyone at my job loved me. Um, when they were having closed door meetings about me, no, no, no. Um, so I had, a, I just, my bottom entailed having a bottle of Chardonnay underneath my desk. Um, I was one of five people running a company, you know, had 40 people re reporting to me, you know, four news bureaus around the world. It was great. I loved shooting off emails at 11 p.m. at night telling people what to do. They must have loved those emails. Um, I want to talk about early recovery. Uh, there are a couple things that people told me that, that really weave into my story. One of them was like, don't talk to people who aren't there. I thought that was a pretty good piece of advice, but it means more than just what it sounds like. I was counting 90 days. I was so excited to tell my mom, like, I'm an alcoholic and I'm getting sober. And I remember telling my mom, I'm an alcoholic. I've discovered it's not, it's not about being in this abusive marriage that I drink. It's not about, you know, um, anything else. It's, you know, it's about being an alcoholic. I have a disease. And uh, my mom was like, no, 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 no. Your great uncle, your great uncle Jim has a disease. You line up five shots of Jim Beam, seven or something like that, and then you chug it with a beer. That's alcoholism. So because I hadn't lost my job, I hadn't lost my marriage, and I wasn't doing shots of Jim Beam, um, I, I couldn't be an alcoholic because I was, you know, I had, I hadn't lost everything and I was just drinking Chardonnay. There was no way I could be an alcoholic. Yet, I would wake up at my mom's place when I'd go down and visit with gum in my hair because I drank so much the night before, and my mom would giggle. We would throw, we would not tell Leon, my stepdad, and we would throw the sheet in the freezer so we could get the gum off the sheet so he wouldn't know. It's called enabling. Um, so she was a conspirator to how much I was drinking, and we would giggle at, like, these gum all in my hair and trying to get it tangled out. I was 33 years old. You know, it's not like I was 17. Um, run everything by your sponsor before you do things in your first year. Um, when I decided for the first 90 days I was skipping out of work during lunch to go to a, a noon meeting, um, because if I didn't do this, I was going to die. And I was told this by not only my psychotherapist, but by my sponsor. You will die if you continue to drink. You need to save your life. So... I found out that somebody uh, in the London Bureau, the people were talking in the New York office, where is Beth going? Beth's interviewing for jobs. Well, I needed to make it clear that I was so loyal to my company that I was not leaving. So I called everybody in the New York Bureau into my office. So 15 people. I got London on the phone. I got Hong Kong on the phone, and I got Singapore on the phone. People are waking up at 3 in the morning to get on the phone. So I've got 40 people on the phone. I didn't call my sponsor. I didn't talk to my, I didn't call anybody. Everyone is in my office, virtually or in the office, and I, everyone said, and I said, I hear there's a rumor. 
And I was so impassioned. I, was, I said, I hear this rumor, and I would like everyone to know that I, I wanted to say I love you, but I had the sense not to. That's what we said to each other in the rooms because we were getting sober together. I said, I'm not interviewing. I care about this job, and I just want you to know that um, I am dying. <laughs> but I have a program of recovery. Oh, I didn't say that. I did say I, have a pro- I am dying, but my prognosis is positive. And if I go to this doctor every single day for the rest of my life, I have a chance at surviving. <laughs> so I just got the one-minute signal, so I just want to say this, that... Um, <laughs> Don't make any changes in the first year that are drastic. And I learned why they said this, because everything in the second year hits the fan. I (laughs) no longer have that job. I no longer have my husband, which is such a blessing. Um, (laughs) um, Because you can have as much joy and as much happiness as you want. Um, My life is free of all the things that I made the deal with God to keep. God didn't give me what I wanted. He gave me what I needed, and I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. So thank you. Our main speaker tonight is Max. Thank you. Just a little down, please. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. My name is Max Parker, and I'm an alcoholic. Very nice to be here, and uh, I feel honored to be able to share myself with you, and that's what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes. Um, I want to thank Barbara Tunde for speaking. I love the heart coming out of him up here. Um, that's what this is about, and uh, Beth was phenomenal as well. I very much identified with like the delusion thinking and I, I like the boardroom. I identify with that. Um, I want to thank Heidi for asking me to speak. I love Heidi. Uh, I met Heidi here when I spoke here the first time. And she came up and grabbed me and sat me on the stage. And Heidi got sober about the same age I did. She was a little older. I think she was 16. Um, so and I, then I got to hear Heidi. And I, I've never identified as much with somebody's story as hers. And I'm not saying that because she's gorgeous and blonde. <laughs> Maybe partly, but... Um, <laughs> But really, I mean, one of the things that we have in common, I'm not trying to embarrass Heidi, but I, I, I do love her and I love her energy. And in her story, she talks about something I talk about, which is that at the end of my drinking, and I will tell you my story. It's really exciting. Eighth grade is the best. Um, <laughs> at the end of my drinking, I was having delusions, literally. And, and I, I did so many hallucinations as well as all the drinking. And I do not dwell on drugs in my story because this is AA. Um, but because of all that, um, I thought I was Jim Morrison. I didn't like, I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't just like think I, I was Jim Morrison, you know? And to tell you what's happened in the last 28 years, 27 years, is, uh, I jumped up a couple months. Um, I was in spin class the other, I have spinning this morning. And Peace Frog's a great door song. And every time it comes on, my spin teacher's like, Max, I think of you. When this song comes on, and then I yell out, that's because I wrote it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then nobody really gets it, because they're all just normal people getting up and spinning at 6 o'clock, you know? But I just wanted to tell that story. It's a true story. Um, <laughs> but I did. I, I got this, my, my, my home group is the Harbor Island group. My sobriety date is June 16th, 1981. I uh, have a sponsor. His name's Clancy. He'll be speaking here in a couple weeks. And... Um, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I always say this when I speak, that I don't say the four most dangerous words in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is, I will qualify briefly. Because if I do say those words, at 25 minutes when she holds the thing up, I'm going to be in seventh grade, and you're all going to be, like, wanting to kill yourself. And uh, I was asked to speak down in Dallas when I was 12 years sober, and I asked how long I should speak for, and they said an hour. I'm like, I got sober at 15. And they're like, well, just tell the whole story. You know, like, really, just get it, you know, so I was like, and then in sixth grade, you know, and I looked at the clock, and there were like 10 minutes to go, and I was like, oh, my God. So I learned, you know, I, if I sit here and tell you this, it's it's not good to anybody, and me either. Um, but I did, I am a real alcoholic. I drank very intensely. 
I am very lucky that I've never lived in the delusion that I, it was a phase that I, you know, my mom was paranoid because I was 15 and throwing up all the time and blacking out and threw me in rehab and that's why I'm sober. When I was about 12 years sober, I had dinner with my cousin who is a very heavy drinker and she said that to me. She said, Max, wasn't it like your mom just freaked out because her dad died of alcoholism and, and then threw you in rehab and, you know, that alcoholic thinking, you know, that keen alcoholic mind was like, that's it. My mom was paranoid. I was, you know, I was at that point 12 years sober and that's not it. I, um, I drank very heavily and I, I earned my seat here as much as anybody. And the thing for me, and it doesn't matter if it happens to you, and I hope it does. I, I, I can't believe I'm sitting in front of somebody today that has one day. I mean, to me, to actually be able to say that is amazing, because I couldn't have said that. Um, I was thrown into a treatment center, so I really hope we all get to welcome the one-day person after the meeting. Because if you feel welcome here, in my opinion, you stay here. And when you want to use that as an excuse later, you'll leave. That's just my experience. But what happened to me... As my sponsor says, it happened very slowly, what happened when I drank really fast. So I grew up in New York. I, my parents split when I was really young. I grew, out, I grew up an hour out of New York City. I was lucky enough to drive in tonight with a, a childhood friend of mine who is still a very close friend, and it's, it's a special relationship because he, he's sober 18 years, but it's, and that's a special thing. But we have a childhood friendship, and it's great. We drank together, and... And, you know, Fred saw me drink, so if you want to ask him about my drinking, you can ask him. Um, I got to experience his first blackout, which was a lot of fun, because um, then I didn't get to drink. But uh, I drank, I started, I got sober at 15, and I hear people's stories, and they started drinking at four. You know, maybe it was like the stuff on the gums, or that wasn't, that's not my story. I started drinking at 10, and I didn't start drinking, in my estimation, late. Uh, if I knew what drinking did to me at eight, I would have because the way I felt on the inside. Um, and I didn't really start drinking until I was probably 12, you know. But as our book says, that because I was maladjusted to life, because I was full flight from reality, you know, that's not what makes me an alcoholic. You know, I, I could have been a messed up kid, which I was. I was very maladjusted to life, you know, not dealing with things right. You know, I played baseball very good in fourth you know fifth grade they advanced me up to the next league I got hit too many times and quit so the way I dealt with that was not like go join basketball or soccer I joined girls softball because it seemed like a good idea at the time yeah um, because I needed to be a star you know I was the fastest kid in my school you know yeah, I was just I got a trophy yeah <laughs> <laughs> Max Parker, girls softball, 1973. Um, <laughs> went right up there with my swimming trip, yeah. Um, and swimming was one thing I did really well. Uh, I don't know if Lisa's here tonight, um, Lisa L., but we share that. We, I, so I was a very intense swimmer and very good. And, and thank, I mean, I had no principles in my life. And I pray for the good and bad to be removed every day because I can't handle the good as well as the bad. And that's, I believe, why it's there. Or, you know, it helps me to handle the good as well as the bad. Because I would get on the block, I would look to the guy next to me and say, why are you even here? Go home. And I'd win the race. And there was just so much humility pouring out of me. And it was just sad. It was because it was the only way I knew to feel good. You know, and this is pre-drinking all leading into the drinking. And swimming and drinking are very, it's a very important thing because when I was 13, I made a decision to stop swimming which is the one thing I got benefit out of, and drink. And I remember sitting on the curb, waiting for my friends to come home so we could get a couple six-packs and drink. And funny enough, well, it's, I don't know if it's funny or not. That's my story. But I drank a lot of hard liquor early. Um, that's <laughs> I had a lot of hard liquor in my house because my mom was living with an alcoholic. And he wasn't an abusive alcoholic, and he wasn't a crazy drunk alcoholic, and he was never an alcoholic that I looked to and said, oh, God, I can't be like this guy. He was actually the nicest guy in the world. And he took me around to the bars, and I hung out in bars. And that has nothing to do with why I'm an alcoholic. So, again, I was maladjusted to life, and I was a mess. But what happened to me is I picked up a drink on August something of uh, 1975, and 
what happened to me is what it talks about in the doctor's opinion and obsession took over my, I, when I poured the alcohol into my body, the allergic reaction happened to me. We had three quarts of beer and you know, when a quart's not enough, when you're 10, there's a problem. And <laughs> that's what happened. And then, you know, I could kiss a girl and it let me do things that I wanted to do because I couldn't have done them without it. And that's how it started. And then I drink here and there. I drink at my friend's house because he was Italian and they drink wine and I got to drink there. Yeah, they pour you big glasses of wine because that's what they did and their kids never drank it, but I did. <laughs> they didn't, then they didn't let me over anymore. But, um, so that was, that was my drink and, and I just went on and I, I did get into junior high and, um, and then I, it, it started progressing. In my junior high school, they gave you, they, they, they gave an alcohol test, the 20 questions. Um, that if you've been through a treatment center, if you don't, you know about it. And I, and I took it. And it was easy for me to pass because they were like, do you drink before work? You know, I was like, no. You know, do you drink and drive? No. <laughs> and, uh, and I was drinking at the time. And this girl, Amy R., Amy Reynolds, who, you know, she's, uh, she's like, you're an alcoholic. I know you are. And I'm sitting there drinking vodka and grape juice or something, you know. I drank. And I had the alcohol in the locker. If you've ever seen a, you know, bad after school special, that was me. Alcohol was in the locker, and I, you know, drank. Big thing about my drinking is I was a big chameleon. What happened to me, through, especially as my drinking progressed, is I could hang out with any group. It's like I could hang out with the deadheads. I could hang out with the jocks. I could hang out with because I really was a jock, and then I became a frock, which is a freak who was a jock. And then by, <laughs> this is a good thing for Northern Westchester. And then. Uh, and then I became a total freak. But, and I didn't plan on that because I, I didn't want, deep down I didn't want that. But 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, I was kicked out of school each year and it was de- directly because of drinking. You know, when a kid got sliced in the arm because of a knife and I was involved with it because I was drinking that morning. And I had drunk the night before at my house and we had a party and I had bought a lock knife. And then we ended up deciding to, you know, try to fight this kid and slice his arm. And the cops are yelling at me how serious this is, I could care less because we're having a party that night that has a big keg and, you know, a whole bunch of alcohol. So it, the fact that I might have hurt somebody and, and all this stuff just didn't even come into my mind. And so the chameleon thing, it was like I could hang out with this person, I could hang out, you know, and I got to watch that in AA, you know, because I could tell, you know, a certain story here, I could tell a certain story there. You know, if I'm speaking in New York City, I might mention that I drank in Europe, which I did, you know. Because they like that, you know. It's like when I drank in Paris, you know, and, and then they say I drank in Paris, and it's a good identification. Or if I'm just speaking out in Westchester, I might dwell on the drinking in the woods or whatever. <laughs> uh, if I'm speaking at the Atlantic Group, I might mention page 52 about the de- bedevilments just to impress you, you know. Uh, the fact that I read this and study it and, and take people through it, um, but. Truth is, I, what's happened in Alcoholics Anonymous is I become myself. And the best thing about it is it doesn't matter where I am, I'm the same person. And it's, it took me a long time, and I'll get into this a little later. But thanks to the 12 step, I actually became the same, you know, one person. I don't think that takes, an, you know, a couple of weeks or a year. I think, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to happen when you're here, but it takes some work. And it takes work going through the book, taking the 12 steps, working with a sponsor, and doing all the things we do. So what happened was it, the trouble kept happening, and my mom sent me away to boarding school, and at boarding school, things just got really out of hand, and <clears throat> I don't know why they knew I had a problem with drinking when I put all these bottles of alcohol on the wall, um, and two weeks into boarding school, they're like, you have a problem with drinking, and we're going to catch you drinking, and, and it seemed like boarding school was just trying to get through boarding school, not getting caught drinking, you know, that's, that was the goal. I made it until the day before the last day of school which kind of seemed to be my thing. It was like I drank all the time, did a lot of other stuff, and the day before the last day of school, I'm walking with a six-pack, and the guy catches me. That was two weeks prior to me getting sober. The next day, I'm walking around Boston train station asking people that look like my parents if they'll buy my watch so I can drink because I couldn't take the Amtrak from Boston to New York without drinking. It had gotten to that. I'd walk up to total... St- That's how I was. I, I didn't have any shame. I drank in New York City a lot. My dad worked downtown off 36th Street, and I'd meet some guy in McDonald's while I'm waiting for him, and then we'd party, you know, because I just met him. And he asked me for matches. I knew what he wanted. He didn't ask me for a lighter (laughs) 
or a light. Um, and then I'd walk in my dad's office, you know, blotto. And, and then, I, you know, I'd be like, where's the candy machine, you know? And it was just like that. It was just wherever I was, I did my thing. And I did drink in Europe. My mom took me to Europe, and I was with my mom and my grandmother. And, you know, I supposedly couldn't drink for two weeks. After six days, I was about to scream. And to me, this is what alcoholism is. It's not the fact that when I started drinking, which I did, I couldn't stop. For me, about the second and a half beer, it seemed to kick off, you know. And I, and I always wanted to stop it, too. Because when I was about 14, I'm like, when I start drinking, I, you know, I get out of hand, so I'm going to have a couple beers tonight. I'm going to hang out, have some fun, have some laughs, you know, be like every other kid and just like goof off. It, it wasn't like that. After the second or third beer, I just kept drinking. And then I started saying things I shouldn't say. And then I'd wake up after a blackout and people wanted to kill me. That <laughs> seemed to be the case a lot. Um, just a lot of terror because of things I did when I was drinking. So six days into being in Europe, I was insane, so I'd run back to my mom's room and drink all the wine that she has, and then get into a big fight with her in con and run away from her, <laughs> drunk. And I'd never been to Europe, never been to con. I'm 14, and I'm drunk, and I wake up and I don't know where I am. And it was just that kind of things that happen all the time. You know, I'd wake up, I'm like, where am I? And people, they don't even speak English, you know, and I don't speak any French. Um, so it was just stuff like that was just going on all the time. So I'm walking around Boston train station, that whole thing. I'm sitting on my dad's porch because I, I can't even stand being around my mother. I'm drinking a vodka and orange juice because it just kind of got to the point where I'd wake up, drink vodka and orange juice, uh, listen to dead, do, do all the stuff I was doing. And, uh, all my friends were still in school because boarding schools get out early. My mom told me I had to come down to Baton Rouge, to uh, Louisiana, because my stepfather had, uh, had, was in the tugboat business, and what, she lied to me to get me down to Louisiana. And to make a long story short, the day before I get down to Louisiana, she buys me some beer and says, Max, on June 16th, you're going into a treatment center uh, for kids who have dr- drug and alcohol problems. And part of me was disgusted and hated her, and part of me was, like, so grateful that she was going to, maybe maybe there was going to be something to it, and maybe not. And I, I didn't really know. I figured, because dishonesty was such a big part of my disease, I figured I could go into this place, lie, like I always lied, and just get out. And I remember walking into the treatment center, and there's this guy on the second floor, and he's wearing pajamas, he's smoking a cigarette, and, I'm think, and I got a very cool outfit on with two deadhead stickers on my pants, my Grateful Dead stuff, my hair is long, I'm weighing about 140, and I'm like, that poor sap. Look at him. God, that stinks. The guy's in a hospital. He's smoking a cigarette, right? Now, 15 minutes later, I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette in pajamas. Like, you know, Mom, where are you going? You know, sh-. And they locked the doors, and it was a very good treatment center. I was supposed to be in there for seven days, and this is for the one-day person. And I don't know if she's heard anything I've said tonight or anybody else who said they were counting days tonight. But I heard a story when I was six days sober from a guy who had 58 days sober, and it blew my mind. I didn't understand how somebody could be 58 days sober. Why would you want to be 58 days? And he was all fired up. He, was, he had done the first five steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was charged up. And uh, that's how, you know, it says so clearly in our book that self-knowledge avails us nothing. It's a point we want to emphasize and re-emphasize. And it's something I always talk about when I speak, because knowing I'm an alcoholic is not what, got me sober. What got me sober was, you know, communication with other alcoholics and practicing all of the steps. Just the identification alone wasn't enough, you know, because I got that camaraderie feeling, but as it says very clearly, and there's a solution, it's not enough. I needed more. I needed a solution, a power greater than myself. And this treatment center did that. They did the first five steps through the book. That's all you did. And then the I was 15 when I still left the place, so their thing was, he's not, he's 15, he'll drink again. And I went to a halfway house where you got a home group, you got a sponsor, you know, you did everything you're supposed to do. And that, and that was their whole goal in, in helping me. And I did the steps and I, you know, I, I went to meetings, I got a sponsor, and, uh, it was very powerful. The man who took me to my first meeting killed himself three months later. 
And he was about three or four years sober. And when you're really new, a guy who's three or four sober seems like he's sober forever. And I only bring that up. I bring it up. I don't always say it when I speak, but I think it's important for new people. The reason we found out that that happened is because he had secrets. He had some serious, you know, sex secrets and financial secrets. And it, that was why that happened. And, you know, it was a good thing to learn while I was on my sixth and seventh step. Because if I have secrets and I'm sober, that might happen to me sober. I can get really messed up sober if I'm not practicing these steps. You just don't, you know, my sponsor told me when I was down there, he looked at this guy. He said, see that guy? He's been sober for five years on the first three steps. He loves meetings. He goes to meetings. He said, you can have that or you can do it all. And I was very lucky because in Baton Rouge, they were very step oriented. There were a lot of crawfish balls, you know, they boiled, whatever they call them. There were like 200 people would get together, you know, and it was a lot of fellowship. It was a lot like the Pacific Group in a way. There was a lot of fellowship and a lot of steps. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just meetings and really good steps. And it wasn't just fellowship where you could survive on the fellowship. But that happened to a lot of people. My home group down there, a lot of people would try to survive on the fellowship. It doesn't work. And then I, after my first year, I moved up to New York and I joined the Mamarinic group. And that was, you know, a great experience because I, they were very group oriented. They had a big sign that said the world famous Mamarinic group. And just like the energy in this group, I mean, you guys know what it's like. It, it was very energetic. Ray O'Keefe was a member of that group and he ran the group and it was awesome. And there, we had group anniversaries and I was taught to shake people's hands after the meeting when they spoke. I was, sh I was taught to not speak on a step if I haven't done it. And I was taught also a lot of fun because there were a lot of funny things shared and it seemed like the more deep somebody was sharing, the laugher we were laughing. It's like the worse the story is, the louder we're laughing, you know? And that's what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was taken to the steps. And um, I was taken all the way through the 12 steps. And I, I share this for an important reason, too. When I was 17, I, I got my first sponsee. And our book's very clear that we shouldn't, we got to be careful when we 12 step. Because the 12 step, we have a spiritual awakening, and then we carry this message to the alcoholic, right? This is the message we carry, a spiritual awakening. And I can tend to overmanage. When I was 17, 18 years old, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to overmanage people's lives when I started to sponsor them. And when they'd call me up and say, Max, I'm having a hard time at work, I'd be like, so quit, you know? Like, what the f <laughs> you know? I, what the hell? Yeah, you know, they'd be like, you know, my wife's really annoying me. I'm like, leave her, you know? <laughs> We're supposed to be at meetings anyway. Uh, and that's like that, like, excitement AA, you know? It's like, you don't care. I'd go up to a guy like Barbara Tunde's size and be like, sit down, shut up. You're like, yeah, and we might fight. It, I hope, I didn't say it to you. Um, but that was the kind of energy I had. I didn't care. Like, I was so fired up with this. But that's what happens. I believe, as our 12 and 12, the energy that's released when you do all 12 steps. It's just not like the first three. And um, it, it's so tempting me for me to talk about so many. I've been sober for for 27 years. It's been more than half my life, and it's 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 been exciting. And um, we we had a 12 we had a 12 step meeting the other night, and it's my experience. I've been through all kinds of stuff in sobriety. I've graduated high school. I've graduated college. I've you know tried to be an actor. I've I've done all kinds of things and adversity and, and not adversity. But through everything that I've been through, financial problems when I was 12 years sober, and that's embarrassing when you're 12 years sober and you got financial problems because you got guys pulling up to your house in Mercedes asking about the third step. And you're saying, just go to meetings, you know, whatever. So I had to get honest about, about what was going on and deal with it and do what I needed to do about it. Um, so, but it's all on page 116 of the 12 and 12, it says that when we develop still more, the best source of emotional stability is to be God himself. And my experience is that no matter what's going on, if it's financial, if it's in my home life, or if it's, you know, at work or whatever, it's more spiritual growth. And we don't practice these principles perfectly, but we have spiritual progress, not perfection, and I do it. But I do it. So I got into a relationship at four or five years, and it took over my life. And I had been sober, and I had been sponsoring guys, but it got in the way of that too. And then I had a little breakdown between my fifth and sixth year because it became my higher power. 
And I don't, I'm sure nobody can relate to this, but uh, that's what happened to me. And then a very powerful thing happened for me because the Harbor Island group was formed. And uh, that was in 1987. And I got to, she stayed in the Mamarna group and I got to join the Harbor Island group. And I got to become the GSR for that group. And I got to go to become a DCM. And I got to go all over the five boroughs and do all kinds of good, near, you know, exciting stuff. We had a committee that started the first Joe and Charlie seminar that was at Marymount College in 1988. And that was kind of changed my life. You know, and then I became an expert on the book. <laughs> and I told everybody about the book. <laughs> and they love that. Um, because I think this is really important. But I believe the experience, I don't say it's more important, but I, I do, in a way. I mean, I think, I think at some point you have to get what's in here, as Bob talks about in the story. You know, if you don't, he feels sorry for you. But, it's not an intellectual prog- uh, process. It's why I love Clancy so much. Clancy will be the first one to tell you that between, from the time he leaves here and gets to that coffee pot, he can be a mess. I love that. You know, and he's 50 years sober. And we talk every week. And my sponsor, Pete, who's in Westchester, who I've had since I had two years of sobriety, we talk every week. He's like my best friend. And, and it's, it's a, he's the guy I work through the steps with and I still talk to. And knows when I'm, he sees me every week, knows what's going on, can, point stuff out to me. So when that happened at between five and six years, I took the third step like I had never taken it before. You know, I started seeing things in the book that I had never seen before. You know, they talk about defiance being the outstanding characteristic of the alcoholic. You know, um, you know, the seven step prayer took on a totally new meaning. Pete had been trying to tell me for years that the whole point of that prayer is that we're supposed to be of use to, to God and the people in our lives. And intellectually, I kind of understood it, but I really didn't get it. You know, until I went on a date, and we had a really nice time, I thought, and I worked out with this girl's brother. And the next day, I'm like, so Matt, did you have a good time? He's like, yeah, but you said you talked about yourself a lot. You know, so I was like, ah, oh, maybe that's what Pete's talking about. You know? And uh, that's the seventh step. And then I kept going in my acting, but the service is what saved me through this whole thing, doing tradition work, doing step work. I started sponsoring people differently. I didn't try to overmanage. I just started sharing myself. And um, 10 years sober, I moved into the city, really went after the acting. You know, I had a couple of fun things that happened, but nothing happened. It's a, you know, but I got to meet Frank M., who is the archivist of the World Service Office. And I got to have him in my life for three or four years and got to do big book studies with him and learn more about the traditions than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm not supposed, I don't want to, I don't get into tradition talks when I tell my story much because then it's, then it's like dry sandpaper when like someone's telling their story. You know, it's like then the DCM and, you know, and the branches of service and, you know, it's like talking about the concepts. But, but if what Frank did for me with the traditions is he said, Max, when you make them personal into your life, they're very powerful. I met my wife when I was 14 years sober. I could not have met my, my wife and had the relationship we have today if it wasn't for the traditions. I work all 12 traditions with my wife. We can't be in the relationship if we don't have a desire to be in it. The power in our marriage is, is God in the second tradition, and we have to want to be in the relationship, which is the first tradition, and the only way to have unity is to, you know, be in it. And if you go through them, it's very powerful. And I work it. We're self-supporting through our own contributions. So Frank really helped me with that. We would sit and pray. We would read Emmett Fox, and sit quietly. He taught me to do that. I, I don't sit quiet very well, uh, but I, I do it every day. I get on my knees every morning and every night. I have n- probably missed four days in the last 27 years, and that's because my kid was crying with diapers or something, and I had to go to the hospital. I don't miss it. The foundation I got when I was early in sobriety has kept me to this time. If you're in your first year, please understand how powerful... A foundation is okay it takes twice as long to build the Empire State Building as it does to build the foundation and you, you cannot when you're getting told to come early meet your sponsor read the book do whatever you're being asked to do it's because they love you we're not here to break down anybody's ego I'm not I'm here to help somebody you can't help anybody who doesn't want your help that's the problem you know that this group was formed and thanks to this group, I have Clancy. 
because I started to get to know Clancy back in 93, 4, and uh, better. I had always known Clancy since, I was, since 1982. I heard him in 1982. I was, you know, 16 at a first conference down in Louisiana, and I was laughing my butt off, you know, and it was a phenomenal. And I, I luckily sponsor a man in this group named Vince, who it's the biggest joy in my life. And that wouldn't have happened if you guys didn't form. You know, he asked me a couple years ago, and it's been phenomenal for me because my AA doesn't consist of one kind of three-block radius. It consists of, I sponsor guys up in Connecticut that aren't my home group, you know, Vince and a couple other people down in the city. And it, it's it's the joy of my life. The pure, what it says on page 89 of our book, that to watch people recover, to watch their lives change, that is the great excitement for me in my life. And so I married my wife. We had two amazing children. And I'm going to end with this. is my child, nine years old, down in Florida. We just went down to Disney World. And I just got to tell you, if you go to Disney World, you need all 12 steps. <laughs> Don't go there unless you're really sober. But I'm having a really good, because you want to punch Mickey right in the face at some point. But I'm having this talk with my daughter about God. And this is it. This sums it all up for me. Is I'm on the bus with my daughter, and we're talking about God, and I'm talking to her that, you know, I said, Riley, it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. It has everything to do with on the inside. And my daughter turned to me. She says, you know, Dad, I feel like I've had a pretty smooth life so far. You know? I said, and that's it. She's also the same daughter. When I asked her why, I said, Riley, do you know why I'm going out to Clancy's anniversary? She said, no, I don't know. I said, because he hasn't had a drink for 50 years years. I said this to her. We're having lunch together. She looked at me dead serious and she said, is he really thirsty? (laughs) And and, and that's it. So we have fun here, Debbie. I'm so glad you came and uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.